Well, here we are again with uh, FB Watch Forum and uh, our uh, watch uh, kind of show review. Uh, and there it is. Uh, there are my two favorite guys there, uh, you know, making sure that uh, uh, we let our wives or significant others know that in their minds, at least, we are going to limit our watch collection. We, of course, know that isn't true. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I gotta, I'm going to have to talk to my partner, Rick. I'll let, bring Rick on, Rick Moscoso. Uh, I don't know where we came up with that music, but, uh, man, that, that, you know, we ought to get some uh, Buffalo Springfield or something in there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so here we are. And uh, today is going to be a uh, kind of a, uh, a mixture of some um, – some watches that uh, uh, I've had for a while uh, and that you might be familiar with, and we're going to mix in with them uh, some high-end pieces. And uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, some inner workings of, uh, of an automatic watch, which in this case today would be the, uh, would be the balance wheel and the mainspring. So let's start off uh, today with a uh, piece um, – that you know, it, it's it's I really like it. It's a it's a Chinese automatic, and it's made by, uh, as you can see, it's made by Sterling Original, and it's got uh, some guilloche work, and of course, it's not hand guilloched, but it's uh, it's uh, got some guilloche work here. You can see up close on the dial. Uh, it's got a day and a date window. And, uh, and it's an automatic timepiece uh, with uh, a white dial, of course, and it has a gold uh, plated uh, hour markers in uh, Arabic hour markers. And, of course, it's got a, a fairly thick leather band. It's about a 24 to 25 millimeter thick band uh, with a dual deployment clasp. So uh, the watch comes uh, with a few extras considering... Um, that it wasn't a high-end piece by any means made by Sterling Original. Here's what it looks like on the wrist. And you can see it's uh, trying to get a good, I'm using a new camera today, so I'm going to do the best I can to kind of get it, get it uh, close to it so you can look. But there it is on the wrist. It's a good size watch. Uh, it is a rectangular watch, but it takes up a lot of real estate on the wrist, as you can see, simply by my seven and a half inch wrist. This is not uh, a small watch by any uh, stretch of the imagination. Uh, it, Sterling does a lot of things to try to copy major, uh, major brands. And I say copy, but you know, they, they, they try to utilize as many components as they can, not components, but design models that they can from other brands uh, without uh, getting sued by that brand. And this is kind of borrowed from a Gerard Perigo uh, design. Uh, Gerard Perigo being a uh, being a high end Swiss brand, uh, and this is kind of similar to a watch that Gerard Perigo has made, but uh, Gerard per Perigo's model is just probably a, a wee bit smaller than this one. But anyway, that's a Sterling original. It's an automatic uh, Chinese automatic. You can see the uh, the inner workings of the watch right there, uh, and it's in great shape. And by the way, I am not going to advertise pricing on watches any further. Uh, I just uh, will allow anybody who uh, is interested in purchasing a watch to give me a call or uh, private message me and uh, let me know if there's a watch uh, that they've seen that they're interested in. So anyway, that's our first watch of the day, the Sterling Original. You can also email Bill at this email address. It's on the screen, too. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Okay, our next watch is going to be a quartz watch, and it's kind of a unique uh, kind of a timepiece. Um, made back in the day, again, when uh, Invicta used to make Sapphire Crystal. It's a Grand Lupa. It's very hard to see, of course, because of the domed style of the crystal uh, that comes with the Lupa, but it's on a black... Uh, uh, leather strap with uh, white stitching. It has a unique feature in that it is a big date. 
It's got a big date at the 12 o'clock position. If you can see that, let me get it up there through the camera. There you, there. Go. there you go. So you can see the big date here. But interestingly enough, around the outside, right where the hour markers start to about here. So it's about maybe uh, an eighth of an inch. All the way around the watch is white mother of pearl. And it's a pretty good high quality white mother of pearl. While the inside of the watch. Move it to the right. There you yeah. go. There you go. The inside of the watch, and you can see right there, is meteorite. So you can see the meteorite on the inside of the dial. And you can see the mother of pearl around the outside of the uh, timepiece, of the outside of the dial. So it has mother of pearl and meteorite. Uh, and it is a... Uh, a better quartz watch. Uh, I believe it's a StarTech movement. <clears throat> it is not uh, a, a, a typical G10. It is, a, uh, it is, of course, a chronograph. And there you can see the thickness of the, uh, of the watch itself. You can see some must and dirt on there, but great watch. I, I like it. Again, this is when Invicta used to really make uh, higher quality timepieces in my personal opinion and it's also uh when uh the grand lupa was made in when more uh in, in in more production because now of course they have this revolution model which is huge and you can see the great i love it because it's got loom it's got a lot of loom on the uh, hands and you can see the red second hand which gives it a nice little contrast this is really a uh, really a great timepiece so that's our second watch of the day. Our third one is going to be the most famous commander made by Swiss legend ever, and that's the, uh, the golden blue model. It's a 46 millimeter case. I think it plays more like a 48 on the wrist. And uh, you can see the deep ocean blue dial with the... Uh, with the gold case and the blue sport band. And you can and you can see, and this comes with a dual deployment clasp, actually, by the way. Let me put this on the wrist for you. You can um, really get a flavor for the sportiness of the watch, uh, despite the fact that it has a, a gold case, a yellow gold case, because a lot of sports models were being made with yellow gold and blue uh, from different brands. Uh, Invicta did a lot of that, uh, as a matter of fact. But this is a uh, this is a commander. You can see it's a it's a hefty timepiece, very thick, and it plays like about a forty eight millimeter on the wrist. And this is uh, an Eta G ten movement, quartz movement. You see, it's got a, a date at the four o'clock position. Great little timepiece. I shouldn't say little, but it's a great timepiece. Uh, you can see the uh, dual deployment clasp. Just hooks right in there. And I've had this timepiece for quite a while, and uh, I've enjoyed it. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great, and it's got screws on the back, so if you want to change the battery, you just unscrew the uh, screw-down case back. You just have your tool, and you unscrew it, and you're good to go. There it is, the Commander. And uh, this is a dive watch, by the way. That's our second watch, our third watch. It's going to be kind of an interesting watch that I bought. Um, and it's an e-guard, okay? This was advertised uh, on World of Watches back when they had their show. And you can see... That it's got a moon phase. It's a Japanese automatic. Let me give it a little bit of a wind here. And I'm going to use the pointer and show you something. These little spots right here on the watch. Let me see if I can get a good shot of this. Right... 
you see the little dots going right around the moon phase here. Those are meteorites, uh, particles of meteorite that they put around the moon phase to kind of give it the spacey feature of the watch. And you can see the interesting shape of this watch. And I wonder if anybody recognizes this. The shape of this watch is the shape of the insignia that was worn on the Star Trek series, the original Star Trek series, because this watch, the owner of eGuard made this watch in cooperation with William Shatner, Captain Kirk. So that's why the watch is shaped in the form of the insignia that was worn on the uniform of the Star Trek personnel. And let me open it up. It's got a, a dual deployment clasp as well. Got a nice supple uh, leather strap, uh, excuse me, a supple um, silicone strap. None of those hard rubber straps that are going to break on you. In any event, you can see it on the wrist. It's a really kind of a cool shape. As I said, I, that's why I was interested in it. And I love the fact that it was kind of all blacked out with the exception of the uh, case. Uh, and uh, it's just kind of a really cool, unique yeah. timepiece. Move it over to the uh, to your right again. Uh, I, what I was noticing on there is the dimpling um, on the right half of the face. The dimpling on the right half. Yeah, on the face. It's it. Oh yes. Like... Uh, well, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a uh, uh, a pressed kind of a checkerboard kind of a imprint, Rick. I know it's hard to see. Let me see if I can get it over here a little bit better. Let me take it off my wrist. That'd be easier. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there you, you can kind of see it there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so half the dial is kind of a smooth. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say a sun ray, but kind of a uh, uh, more of a matte black kind of a dial. And then the right, the uh, left hand portion, my left, your right, would be the. Uh, Hold it right there. Hold it still yeah, right there. There that, you go. That that's going to be, and you can really see the color of the. Uh, uh, the little blue in the center of the hand. It's showing about uh, 20 minutes to 6 o'clock. As of right now, you can see the, the time oscillating by way of the uh, inner workings of the watch. I want to bring this up. You can see the, um, the balance wheel going there on the inside. Let me see if I can get that close up here. You can see the balance wheel going back and forth. See it there on the bottom of the uh, right-hand bottom portion of the screen. Yeah. Bring it slightly closer to you so it focuses because it's out of it's out of the focus. Right there, right there, right there, right there. And that's what I wanted to bring up a little bit. I wanted to talk about these components before we go on to the next watch. Since we hit this uh, unique automatic watch, I did want to speak to. The movements a little bit and give you kind of a, a little bit of a picture about what's going on uh, the main spring of the watch let's take the main spring first of all that's the central power source for the watch movement it is a spiral strip of metal contained in a circular enclosure called the barrel and i'm going to point a, put a picture of this down here while i talk and i want to see if hopefully you can can we switch back to the watch camera rick Can we? Uh, yeah, there we go. So take a look at that while I while I speak to it. So the outer end of the mainspring is hooked to an inner wall on the barrel. Okay, here's the mainspring, and the inner end is hooked onto an arbor. Here's the arbor. So this inner end of the mainspring is hooked onto the arbor or the barrel. Uh, and then when this is wound, this, this arbor or barrel is hooked up to your stem. And as you wind the stem, the mainspring gets tighter. Okay. And uh, the spring gets wound up, storing the energy that makes the watch run. So to wind the mainspring, the arbor is turned right here. So the spring is wound around the arbor. 
And then, of course, in some hand-wound watches that are not automatic, you have to be careful. You, careful, you don't wind it so tight that you break the mainspring or the arbor. In an automatic watch, most times you have the automatic cutoff that will stop. No matter how many times you wind it, it won't. It has a safety mechanism to, to not wind any tighter. Now, how do you determine the correct dimensions, width, or thickness of a mainspring? It might be thought about as... Uh, uh, as a problem for the designer and the manufacturer of a watch movement. And indeed, when designing a new caliber, uh, a manufacturer will have to determine the correct strength and the length of the mainspring. And usually such a calculation is done by way of experience in, uh, in terms of the past watches that the uh, uh, watchmaker has worked with. But remember that the mainspring barrel and the arbor has to be the correct size to accommodate the spring. So this barrel and this arbor has to be correct enough in size and, and dimensions to be able to accommodate this mainspring. Now, sometimes springs need to be replaced when they get tired. And again, you'll have to know what size to use. Um, but for modern movements, it's possible to simply look up the correct spring in certain tables that are posted. Uh, and for off for older watches, sometimes that's not always possible, and that's when you're really going to need uh, the the input of a watchmaker. So, usually, typically, very generally, uh, the mainspring uh, typically has to be replaced at least once over the life of the watch. So, there's your mainspring. There's your arbor. There's your barrel. It's uh, connected to your to your uh, crown. So as you wind the crown, your main spring is getting tighter, and that's really the power uh, that focuses in on your watch. Now I want to talk a little bit about a, about the balance wheel, and I want to put a picture of the balance wheel up. And there's the balance wheel, right here. So the balance wheel is the timekeeping device used in mechanical watches, mechanical, pure mechanical, or mechanical automatics. Uh, and they work like the pendulum of a, of, a, uh, of a clock. It is a weighted wheel that rotates back and forth that you saw in the picture of the last watch I showed you. It just goes back and forth, tick-tock, tick-tock. Um, and it's returned to its center position back and forth by the release of the power from the mainspring. So the mainspring sends the power to the balance wheel. The balance wheel oscillates back and forth, and that's how you get your tick-tock, and that's how you get the movement of your hands to tell time. So remember that um, um, each swing of the wheel allows the gear train to advance a set amount, and that moves the hands forward. The balance wheel and the mainspring form a harmonic oscillator, okay? It's, it, they work in harmony, in other words, which due to the resonance oscillates preferentially at a certain rate. Some oscillate at 2,800 uh, beats per minute. Some oscillate at different uh, beats, and, and that's going to determine uh, the type of movement you have in part, and it's also going to determine how you would set your, your, uh, your watch winder because... Watch winders sometimes are capable of, uh, of uh, setting a watch on there and setting the, the rotation of the, uh, uh, of the unit uh, based on the number of oscillations that a particular watch has. So the combination of the mass of the balance wheel and the elasticity of the spring, mainspring, keeps the time between each oscillation or tick very constant, accounting for its nearly universal use as the timekeeper in mechanical and mechanical automatic watches. And here's the part I want to kind of impress upon. From its invention in the 14th century until the tuning fork and quartz movements became available in the 1960s, virtually every portable timekeeping device used some form of balance wheel. And now, of course, after the advent of, uh, of um, uh, quartz movements, uh, mechanical automatic and mechanical movements have become even more popular and, and even more collector's items and, of course, have improved over time. And so last but not least, what I'd like to show you is a picture, a wider shot of the combination 
of the mainspring. Hey, Bill, the bring, bring, it, bring it to your right a little bit more. No, no, to your right. There you go. So you got the balance wheel and the mainspring. Here's your stem, right? And it's hooked up and it's connected and it makes the mainspring wind. That sends the power to the balance wheel, which os oscillates back and forth and which causes the movement of your hands. So those are the two central features of uh, an automatic or mechanical automatic, uh, mechanical or a mechanical automatic timepiece. And they really uh, set the tone for how your watch is going to, uh, to work because without them, uh, you're not gonna find those by the way, of course, in a quartz watch. Well, let's go to another timepiece. Uh, that I want to show you. And this one is kind of a popular timepiece for you guys. This is one of my last remaining Sabaquanoma 3s. Again, Sabaquanoma 3, when it was made with a sapphire crystal. This is an SW200 automatic movement. It's got a unique brown, matte brown dial. It is a uh, GMT. You can see the GMT hand there. That's two time zones. You can see the little red GMT hand right there. And it's got a uh, date at the three o'clock position. It is 500 meters water resistant. And it is a limited edition number 222 out of 500 made for the world. Uh, and it's, of course, it's got the unique gnarling that a Sabakwanoma 3 has. I want to put this on the wrist for you. Give you an idea what, I mean, most of you already know what the size of a Sabakwanoma 3 looks like. There it is. It's a pretty hefty timepiece. It's a good, uh, I don't, you know, it's a good 52 millimeters on the wrist for sure, especially with the crown. But it's a great, great, great piece. I loved it because I loved the, uh, I just love the combination of the silver with the uh, with the brown, uh, and I love the fact that it was a uh, a dual time zone or a GMT. I'm trying to get it. I'm going to take it off my wrist now so I can show you the. There you go. There you can see the red. Uh, There you can see the red hand that is the dual time zone. And you can see the inner workings of the watch, Project Abda, Abda of course. We all know what that is. Uh, but there is the, uh, there's the movement. SW200 Sapphire Crystal, number 222 out of 500. And it is 500 meters water resistant. Okay, let's go to our next timepiece, and that is going to be one of my favorite watches, and certainly one of my favorite quartz watches. This was, I remember when this was sold, people were going crazy to get this. This is a Renato Wildebeest Swiss made root beer brown, sunray brown dial with 2.9 carats of diamonds around the bezel. And on the lugs, as you can see. Root beer dial. I mean, it's just really rich and it's got the... Uh, rose gold bracelet. I mean, this is really a very rich looking timepiece. Let me put it on the wrist for you. There it is. Just a great, great, great root beer dial. 2.9 carats of diamonds. And of course it is a chronograph. You can see the pushers and the crown. 
just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful timepiece. I mean, uh, I just can't emphasize how beautiful this watch is. I love it. Um, let me go to our next piece. That should be our only diamond piece today. You know, I, uh, I've got to get a diamond piece in if I can, right? This is just a great timepiece. I mean, this is just, just a fantastic. Check out this timepiece. This is a platinum mother of pearl with a dragon marking that was made by Android when Android was Android. And you can see the uh, platinum mother of pearl with the uh, gold dragon, all black IP casing with a nice, the typical, beautiful, thick leather band that Android is famous for. There's the, uh, let me see if I can get a picture of the, uh, there you go. There's the automatic movement. Let's see if we can, there it is. There we go. And it uh, is said to be at least a 47 millimeter timepiece. I think it plays more like a 48 or 49, maybe even a 50 on the wrist. There you see, again, keep in mind, I have a seven and a half inch wrist. So you could see what that looks like on my wrist. I have a pretty big wrist and uh, it's a, a beautiful, it's just a beautiful timepiece. Um, the mother of pearl really makes it. It's a Japanese automatic movement. Let me wind this up for you a little bit. There we go. Yeah, she's going. Yeah, she's got some power. You can see the second hand moving. Just a really cool, cool timepiece. I'm not really much, to be honest with you, on the Dragon watches, but um, I love the combination. Uh, one of my weaknesses for timepieces is a combination of black and blue. I love. Uh, I tend to like timepieces that are have a combination of blue and black. And uh, this was emphasized even more by the uh, by the mother of pearl design, as you can see there. So that's that's why I went for it. Hey, Bill, we had a comment from uh, Kevin Lee, and uh, check your messaging. He sent you a private message about the Sabaco okay. Noma Three. Alrighty, All right. I'll and do welcome, that. Welcome to the show. Yep, and let's go to. Um, Let's go to another. I told you I was going to bring some high end pieces on today's show. So here they are. The first one is a 40 millimeter Rolex date just. Now you can see on this date just the things I like about it right here. Let me get a closer shot here. 40 millimeter case kind of plays more like a 40, uh, excuse me, a 41 millimeter case plays like a 42 on the wrist. Uh, here's the beauty of this watch. I want to get just the right shot. This is a gray dial with green Roman numeral hour markers. It was really a proper popular brand for uh, Rolex. And by the way, September 1st, Rolex is coming out with their new models. Um, Here's the green hour markers. You've got a magnified date at the 3 o'clock position, which you can see right there. And I think you can maybe see, I'm trying to get it as close as I can. You can see the green Roman numerals against that gray dial. It's really a cool con contrast, I think. There you go. Beautiful Rolex. Uh, again, with the, uh, the Rolex clasp, it's got, uh, made with uh, 304 stainless steel. It's a higher grade of stainless steel than you, than used in other timepieces. Um, but just a really, really cool, um, dress watch. Of course, I wear all my watches as sport watches. Now you can dress casual with a nice pair of shorts and a shirt and get away with wearing this pretty easily. Is that the one, is that one of them you got just recently? I don't remember you 
um, having that one. I got it when I was back in California um, in uh, October of last year, before the virus, before the virus hit. The next one, what did I say a minute ago about a black and blue combination, right? <laughs> this one, this one is, look at this watch. I mean, I wish you could see it in person. This is the Hublot all black ceramic case with a bright blue sunray dial. And a really rich, thick blue, not leather, but alligator leather strap with a gorgeous deployment clasp. Look at that. Take this off. Let me show you it to you on the wrist. I love this watch. And there's the beauty. Hugh Blow makes the back of their alligator straps with a rubber coating to avoid sweat and other material maybe getting in there and and affecting the uh the uh the alligator can't really see it too well but on the inside of the strap there is a uh is a rubber coating anyway this watch is a big watch it's a, a 45 millimeter watch it's in my sweet spot but it's light as can be because it's made of ceramic and what do we know the other quality of ceramic is? Of course, it doesn't scratch. Ceramic watches do not scratch. There it is on the wrist. This is called the Hublot Fusion. And it's got about a 42-hour power reserve, all Swiss made. High-end timepiece, just gorgeous. And you can see... Uh, because of the color black and blue, it can be worn as a sport watch, but you could easily get away with this as a dress watch too. And look at this, look how thin that watch is. Must be about eight millimeters, easily fits under a uh, dress cuff. Just a, just a gorgeous, I love it. I love this timepiece. And by the way, the hour markers are just a bright, high polished silver. So when you're looking at this watch in person, those things just come glaring at you, like almost like diamonds, uh, which I thought was very, very cool, very unique. That thing's got to be ultra light. Oh, it is. Yeah. I mean, it's like it's like a, wearing a feather on your wrist, but it's a and it's a fairly good sized watch. But yeah, no, it is. I mean, that's the beauty of ceramic. Okay, let me show you another really cool watch I bet you haven't seen before. This, folks, this is really a cool watch. This is, boy, this is a, this is a, this is a big watch, too. This is a Graham. Graham is a high-end watch manufacturer. They're uh, uh, typically an English company, but... They do make all Swiss-made watches, a nice supple uh, rubber band. And here it is. It's a lefty. So you can see Graham on there, right? And you can see it's, a, it's, a, uh, uh, it's not a chronograph watch, but it's a big watch. And it's got the uh, – it's modeled after an airman's watch. So let me show you uh, this watch on the wrist. Okay, you got this watch on the wrist. It's got that beautiful yellow contrast in both the pusher, as you can see there, and on the second hand. And it's a lefty, so you don't have that problem of, you know, the crown digging in the back of your wrist. Now, you want to uh, start the watch. Let's take it off so I can do what I got to do here. You hit the gun at the bottom, the little gun lever. And bring it into the frame a little bit more, Bill. A little gun lever yeah. right here. You press that, and the uh, and the uh, second hand starts to move. You press it again. You stop it, and you hit the yellow pusher to reset. And it's, a, it. and it's a flyback. 
Oops, let's do that again. There you go. So you, you hit it to start it. Then you stop it, and now watch it fly back. It flies back to the 12 o'clock position. So flyback means instead of rotating uh, in a clockwise position back to the 12 o'clock position, it goes counterclockwise and flies back to the 12 o'clock position from wherever it is when you push the pusher and stop the, uh, the second hand. Now, is that feature, is that uh, unique to Graham? Or other watches do that too. Uh, I've never seen another watchmaker use it. I'm not saying that that they don't because I'm not. I don't know, but I have never, and I've seen a lot of high end pieces. I've never seen anybody but Graham use it, and I'm sure Graham for quite a while had a patent on it. Hmm. But um, you see these types of things now coming out after the patent expired because even Invicta is using sort of a pusher similar to that now. Uh, on some of their uh, on some of their timepieces, but let's now. I, when I say I've never seen anybody else use it, I mean I've never seen any other any other high brand high end brand use it. But Invicta and other brands like that use it. And here you can see the beautiful um, movement with kind of the wagon wheel kind of uh, rotor on the back. And as that rotor moves, of course, you know that the timepiece is uh, winding, and it's got a beautiful high quality leather strap just really cool and let me give this a wind <laughs> so now i'm holding the watch upside down when i'm winding it because it's a lefty right so you're always wind it forward so you hold it upside down to wind it and then when you're done you bring it right side up again and you put it on your wrist and this part the crown and the pushers uh, are on the back of your wrist. So, again, they're not digging into your wrist. Really, really cool. Graham is a, you know, you really have to like it. You really have to be in love with Graham or not. Now, they do make timepieces that don't have those type of pushers. But I bought it because I thought, I, I mean, I liked it. And I liked the uniqueness of the uh, timepiece. And... I was familiar with them, so I said, "Well, hell, if I'm going to buy a Graham, which I which I do want to do, I'm going to buy one with the uh, with these kind of pushers." And you can see again up close, this is how it would wear on your wrist. It's a lefty. This is the all black. It's got yellow uh, second hand, really small yellow hour markers, and of course the yellow pusher. Just a really really cool about as cool of a sports watch as you're going to find. Anyway, that's called the Graham Chrono Fighter. C-H-R-O-N C-H-R-O-N-O -O Fighter. And it's modeled after fighter airplane, of course. Now, let me show you the watch that I bought recently and that Rick seems to like very much. And this is the Chopard Racer. Oh, and yeah. You can, you, can see it, you can see it's modeled after a race car. It's got a power reserve, which you can see is almost full. But it's modeled, the power reserve indicator is modeled in the form of a gas gauge, right? Right here. Let me see if I can get a close-up of that a little better. There you, there you go. Sure. So it's modeled in the form of a gas gauge. And you can see the striations on the dial. So the center part of the dial from the 12 o'clock position going down is a matte dial, matte black. And then on each side of the watch, you've got the, uh, the striations with the date at the 3 o'clock position. It's got a beautiful dual deployment clasp. I want to see if I can show you the uh, rotor on the end. I'm going to wear this watch today, so I'm going to take it take it apart here. And I noticed it looked like you had the striations that run down the side of the, uh, uh, the watch itself. Yeah, they run straight down from top mm -hmm. to bottom. And there no, I, I meant on the side, uh, sides of the watch. 
Oh, you mean over here on the case? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, on the edge of the case. Yeah, yeah, very good, Rick. Yep, that is. It's uh, there. It's all machined out, hand machined out. Show part is a very high end Swiss brand. Uh, this is a chronometer, by the way. Um, meaning that it's timed at uh, four different, at least four different positions. They set it down in different positions to make sure that it runs accurate. Uh, and there you can see it's this is a uh, 46 millimeter timepiece plays more like a 48 on the wrist. So sometimes you'll notice I say my sweet spot is 40 to 46. Uh, I'll buy a 46 millimeter uh, watch. And if it looks like a 47 or 48 on the wrist, so be it. I just don't want to buy a uh, 48 to 50 millimeter watch anymore that looks bigger than that on the wrist, you know, 50, 52, 53 except for the ones that I already have and, and, and the few that I don't intend to sell. But there it is on the wrist. you got a pretty good shot. What would you say the thickness was on that, Bill? Uh, this, was, uh, this is about, I'm going to say, 12 millimeters in thickness. Okay. And there you can see the, the beautiful, I still have the blue sticker on the back, but you can mm -hmm. see the beautiful inner workings. I don't think you ever take those stickers off. I, I try not to take them off um, uh, unless the, you know, I really have a, uh, an urge to really view the uh, the inner workings of the watch more closely or if they're ready to peel off because I like to keep the protection on uh, for the, from the sweat and the grime that, that gets on your wrist. But anyway, there is the movement. I'm trying to get a better shot. There we there go. You. Some of these movements are so beautiful in terms of the colors and the and the rubies uh, uh, and the sapphires that that they put in uh, in a watch. But there you can see you see on the right right here. I hope you can see this. Right here, you can see. See that balance wheel spinning? See it going yeah. back and forth? Yeah, it's focusing on the band. It's not focusing yeah. on the band. You need to bring the back of the watch right in the middle of the camera. There you go. You see it down at the bottom right-hand corner? You see that wheel yeah. yep. going back and forth? That's the balance wheel that's being powered by the main spring, and it's giving you the tick-tock tick tock and the movement of your hands to be able to tell time so anyway that's the show part racing model and um it's just beautiful look and look at the band i mean look at the quality of the this this band is such a supple rubber band none of that crap that breaks and and tears and you can see the striations on the side of the uh side of the band and and it's a dual deployment clasp made to look like a regular clasp but but you can see it's dual deployment just snaps into place. And all you do is pull it, you pull it loose and it comes apart. So let's snap this part back together and you can see that snaps into there and then you just pull it apart like that. Anyway, so that's the, uh, the four high end pieces I wanted to show you today was the show Pard, the Rolex, the Hublot, and of course the Graham. And, um, I think that's all we have for today, except for one other watch that I'm interested in moving. It's It looks just brand new. It's a giant bolt. It's all black IP, but you can see it has the eggplant bolt. The eggplant bolt uh, color. And inside of the watch, it's got uh, a brown and a black dial if i can get that close up like maybe you can see it there it's kind of a bronze and a black dial and it's a chronograph all black ip bolt with the eggplant bolt combination and there you can see it on the uh side of the watch black and the eggplant color anyway i'm interested in moving that watch just because i i and there's nothing wrong with this watch it's almost a practically brand new bolt uh, I just don't wear bolts anymore because the, look at the massive size on it. What's that about? Almost a probably a 26 millimeter in thickness and and uh, just a heavy watch and a big watch. And uh, it's just not for me anymore. 
And I actually bought this at the tail end of the time I started disliking larger watches. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really pretty brand new. But anyway, uh, that's it for our show today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, tried to get a little bit of information uh, about the mainspring and the uh, balance wheel. We talked about that a, a bunch, and we brought in some pictures and photos for you to look at. So if you uh, want to go back and, and look at the uh, uh, show and kind of get an idea, uh, uh, a little bit of an education on those areas of the inner workings of the watch, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks. I'm not sure how, show, how long the show is going to last uh, in terms of uh, how long we're going to keep doing the show. Um, I'll just do it hit and miss until I think that there's enough people interested that may want to uh, uh, see some nice timepieces and uh, maybe who are interested in buying some timepieces. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll see how the feedback goes from various members uh, around the watch community. I know a lot of people like to uh, uh, just post watches and talk about watches and go on their merry way. And I understand that, but uh, we'll see how it pans out. This is really something I'm doing because I really enjoy doing it. And as long as I keep enjoy doing it and I figure there's enough enthusiasm around the watch community to uh, uh, to want to participate, uh, then, then we'll keep rocking and rolling with it. Uh, I'd like to see more people participate and, and get interested in uh, speaking about watches, asking questions about watches, talking about watches that they have, uh, watches that uh, that they might want to send me a picture of that I can put on the show, that sort of thing. In any event, I hope you have a great week, guys. Uh, Rick, thanks, as always, for helping out. And uh, look for our advertisements on various watch groups and on FB Watch Forum page uh, for when our next show will be. It'll probably be two weeks from today. And uh, in the meantime, uh, go out there and buy another timepiece. Put up our picture, Rick, if you will. And there we go. That's my motto. Uh, so anyway, have a great day, folks. And uh, don't forget, keep your timepieces in great shape. Your automatics, wind them at least once a, month, once a month, about 25, 30 winds, okay? All right. Take care, everybody. And thanks again, Rick. We'll see you next time.